minutes, and now you will sit for the next 10 hours. So, <laughs> no, but, but um, I think um, this, you know, going out and looking around when it's still light, and, um, you know, as I say, doing some exercise and listening to Guy, it's a wonderful, wonderful preparation to the next session of Humanities. I think we, we got the real solid ground for that. And um, I do hope still that even in the Humanities, and then what we'll do, we'll combine it with most of the topics that we already <laughs> talked yesterday and today. So I want to invite the chair of this um, session, the Humanities session, Professor Ranan Rhein, which is a vice president of Tel Aviv University and a very well-known historian. And um, you check in the internet nowadays and you see all. And uh, I think this is the exact person to run this next session in the multidisciplinary scale. Thank you. Ranan, please. Thank you so much, uh, Mira, for this uh, wonderful uh, conference or uh, colloquium. Uh, so I take great pleasure in welcoming you all to this uh, evening uh, session, which indeed tries, uh, at least in part, to uh, incorporate the humanities into this fascinating, fascinating discussion as to a uh, life under extreme uh, conditions. And in a way, uh, what we just uh, saw and heard is a kind of uh, preamble to the uh, session that uh, you are about, uh, about to uh, listen to. Uh, I guess that during yesterday's uh, session, it was already mentioned that at least three of the uh, major religions in the world uh, all sprang out of a desert either in this specific region or in the larger region in which uh, uh, we live. Uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all sprang from desert visionaries in uh, the region. Although uh, they originally uh, uh, started in thinly populated uh, areas, all three monotheistic uh, religions have had a global uh, impact. Some would argue that even the very uh, idea of one single god can be traced back to ancient Egypt uh, and to the uh, Sahara Desert during the 14th century uh, BC. As you all know, according to Judaism, the descendants of Abraham uh, spent several generations in Egypt until they were laid, led out of this country by Moses. And for 40 years, they wandered in the desert until Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten uh, Commandments. And then took the Israelites uh, to the promised land of Israel. Early Christianity, with its Jewish roots, also had deep uh, roots and connections uh, to uh, desert uh, experiences in this specific uh, region. Jesus himself, according to the New uh, Testament, spent 40 days fasting in the desert. Desert communities were formed by hermits or desert fathers, quote unquote, as they are called uh, sometimes, and they played an important role in the development of Western uh, monotheism. Many tried to combine the idea of a uh, contemptus mundi with the ideal of a uh, fuga mundi and went to the desert. This was not an original or uh, uh, an invention of Christianity. It was embedded in Egyptian culture. People found refuge in the desert uh, in, um, for various reasons, for different reasons, in order not to be drafted to the army, not to pay taxes or debts, or because of religious uh, persecution. But in early Christianity, uh, many wanted to emulate the experience of Jesus in the desert. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, was born in Mecca, an Arabian desert oasis. And as a young man, he went to the desert to pray. And there, on Mount Hira in 610, he had a vision revealing the word of God to him. The desert can be considered, therefore, as a laboratory for new ideas, new visions, a place for contemplation. And this brings me to a short story, a very short story, written by Paulo Coelho, the Brazilian novelist. The story is titled, Contemplating the Desert. And it goes like this. Let me read it out. 
Three people passing in a small caravan saw a man contemplating the late afternoon in the Sahara Desert from the top of a mountain. It must be a shepherd who had lost a sheep, said the first. No, I don't think so. He's looking for uh, something, uh, probably at the sunset when the uh, view is uh, hazy. Maybe he's waiting for a friend. I guarantee that's a holy man. Uh, he's looking for an enlightenment, said uh, the third person. They began to talk about what the man was doing and became so engrossed in the discussion that they almost fought over it. Finally, in order to resolve the matter, they decided to climb the mountain and go to the man himself. Are you looking for your sheep? Asked the first. No, I have no flock. Then you are surely waiting for someone, said the second. I am a lonely man who lives in the desert, was the answer. Since you live in the desert in solitude, you must be a saint searching for God's sign and are meditating, said the third man, delighted. Does everything on earth have to have an explanation? Then I shall explain. I'm merely looking at the sunset. Is that not enough to give a sense to our lives? So this session will focus on uh, uh, humanities, especially on the uh, ancient uh, uh, period, but we'll start with migration issues, not with refugees, asylum seekers, or migrant workers, but with the migration of uh, birds. And there's no other person who could give you a fascinating talk about the migration of uh, birds than Professor Yossi Leshem of uh, uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, he's uh, from uh, the uh, School of Zoology, in the Faculty of Life Sciences uh, at Tel Aviv University, and is the founder and director of the International Center for the Study of uh, Bird Migration. Uh, he's well known, among other things, because of a research he conducted in cooperation with the Israeli Air Force, uh, a, a research which resulted in a decrease of 76% in the number of collisions with uh, birds and thus saving life and a, a lot of money. He has received very many awards. You have the full bio uh, in your uh, booklets. Uh, but I would also like to uh, uh, emphasize the fact that this kind of research is based on cooperation with the Palestinians and Jordanians in this uh, 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 area, so uh, science also brings together different uh, 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 peoples uh, for, with different religious beliefs and different ethnicities. So Yossi, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Professor Anan. First, I have to tell you, the father of Professor Anan is 93 years old, and he's a keen birder, so it's a an advantage. <laughs> I was asked by Mira to talk about uh, bird migration in, co in coping with extreme conditions, but then she told me the session is also on regional cooperation, and you have to talk about this too. So I told her we have only 20 minutes. So I talk fast, and some people are telling me, you are talking really fast. I, I'm always saying I'm much, much faster in Hebrew. So after our very nice tour guided by Guy, I see Guy here, don't take it personally, but when I see the picture of Masada and I see a bearded vulture nearby, I always get excited, not from Masada, but from the bearded vulture. Because I think that, you know, Masada is a World Heritage Site declared by UNESCO, and uh, I think that the heritage of the Middle East is also the birds and the bearded vulture. And just to show you that when so I talk about also extreme conditions with people, with uh, my original activity. And just to show you that in the Middle East, everything is extreme, it was already said in the morning, bearded vultures are a typical bird for high cliffs. They nest in Europe and in Asia, uh, in heights, in Africa, in heights between 1,000 and 6,000 meters. The only place in the world where we had a nest of a bearded vulture in Wadi Tselim, which uh, was mentioned in the morning, uh, was a bearded vulture nest in minus 70, 70 meters below sea level. This you can see only in the Middle East. So uh, another connection to Tel Aviv University, the na Hebrew name of bearded vulture is Peres, like our president, Shimon Peres, and uh, 
Professor Mendelssohn, who was one of the establishers of our university, took him in 1944 in the desert, and suddenly a Paris was flying over. This is a picture from this tour. And the professor started to shout, Paris, Paris, and Shimon at Persky, that was his name, he came from Poland, on spot changed his name from Persky to Paris. So we are really proud that our president, our late president, was named after Albert Vulture. When you're talking on birds in the Middle East, you see that we have an Egyptian vulture, and a Syrian woodpecker, and a Sinai Ronfish, and a Palestine sunbird. And the main issue, which you already talked today, we are, we are a very small country, but we are located in a junction of three continents. So from the political point of view, it's of course a real problem. But talking on bird migration, because many of these migrating birds are uh, overpassing the, Dead sea, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, which I'll tell you in a minute. So as it was again said, we have one billion birds flying over Israel, and a vast number of them are flying over the Great Rift Valley. The weather is really great. So if you come with your wife or your wife is coming with a husband and he's not interested in building, you have it. Now, if you just want to understand what is the biodiversity of our country, you take the size of the country. We have 2,600 species of plants. If you divide it, we have 90.4 species of plants per 1,000 square kilometer. In California, only 36. The same story with birds, 540 species, 43.5 species per 1,000 square kilometer. In Great Britain, only 38. In Germany, 7.7. So a small country in a junction of three continents is a real advantage if you want to study bird migration. So when we are talking in extreme conditions, that is also one of the problems. If you check how many tanks we have per 1,000 square kilometers, we are leading in the world, 152 per 1,000 square kilometers. So these are our extreme conditions that we have to go cope with. So what's the vision? I always like to show the picture of President Bush standing like a bird lover, but he forgot to remove the cover of the binoculars. <laughs> so with politi politicians, you have to be really careful. When I got the picture, it was taken in 91 in the invasion to Iraq. I said, maybe it's not polite to show our American friends such pictures. Fortunately enough, it happened also in Israel to our Minister of Defense a few years ago. So the question is, how do we want to see the Middle East? Like what you are seeing in the news, or what we are trying to do in Tel Aviv University, develop educational activities with Muslims and Jews together. So one big issue for Israel is that the soaring birds, the big birds, they are, they are using the thermals, the hot air, which I'll show you in a minute. So the entire population of the pelicans from the Palearctic zone in Europe and Western Asia are flying over Israel. They have to, to find some stopover size and land at the evening because if you are using thermals, you can fly only at daytime. June, um, Noga was talking, June and October, at night you have no thermals, you, have, you cannot migrate if you wanted to save energy. So they, when they were landing in the Hula Valley in the past, the government of Israel made a huge mistake, dried it out, the same with other countries in the Middle East. So there is a lack of places like this and all these pelicans have to find other alternative places. The entire world population of lesser spotted eagle fly over Israel, 120,000 of them. And as I said, they have to use the thermals. And because over the Mediterranean, there are no thermals, because you know the, the sun is hitting the water and there is turbulence, they make a longer pass. A bird, from, a raptor, like an eagle from Germany, will fly another 800 kilometers through the Bosphorus, Iskandron Bay, and come to the Great Rift Valley where we are. Here you can see them thermaling, and they are flying along the Great Rift Valley, which was again mentioned in the morning. The Great Rift Valley, if you are not aware, starts in the Taros Mountain in Turkey, and 7,000 kilometers goes up to Mozambique. So the high cliffs of the Great Rift Valley and the warm weather are typically ideal for migrating of soaring bears. So the soaring bears are also uh, migrating with the ability to fast for two to three weeks. So with the extreme conditions of flying over the desert, they don't have to feed, they just pass it. But the smaller birds, the passerine, and the waders like the robin, or the uh, starlings, or the waders, they are doing a totally different tactic. What they are doing when the day becomes to be shorter, they, in three weeks, uh, starting to accumulate fat, and a bird like this wader, the red knot, from a bird of about, uh, 133 grams, in three weeks, it becomes a bird of 
234 grams, or double the, 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 the weight, and the, the, the fat that they accumulate is their energy to cross the desert, the extreme desert. So that's just the proportion. You can understand what we are doing. Just imagine these two ladies flying 3,000 feet above ground level, and the, the red nose, which I showed you, they are flying from Sibir to New Zealand, 11,000 kilometers. Now when we have the radio transmitters, which I'll show you soon, we, the, the, the um, Dash is a researcher who followed these birds found out that they are, the minute they leave Siberia, they fly 11 days, 24 hours a day, 50 kilometers per hour. So can you imagine 11,000 kilometers in 11 days? And of course, if they don't have enough fat, they cannot make it. So that's the reason they accumulate a vast number of fat, as I told you. But the sowing birds are flying on a very narrow ridge, and the small birds, they don't have to look for the thermals, so they are flying over Israel on a big front. And this is a radar picture, if not, is a radar echo of a bird which fly at night. So that's one point. Sowing birds can just use the advantage of uh, soaring and not competing with uh, extreme situations. Barnhouse, we have a big project with Barnhouse, which I'll show you soon. They feed mainly on rodents, almost 90% of the food rodents. But in the desert, we have here in the Judean desert, everybody, we have one or two pairs of the Yum's uh, desert owl. This is an owl which is nesting only in our area, in Saudi Arabia and in Sinai. So for bird lovers to see such a, a pair is a, it's a big story. And we have about 100 pairs nesting here. So you can see that now uh, two guys were studying the Yum's Desert Hall, and what they found out, the diversity of the food is really rich. They are not going only on rodents. They got whatever they have in the desert. Like here, they feed on a gecko. Sorry, uh, Noga, that I'm showing pictures like this, but here they are bringing a dormouse, which is quite rare, to the nest, uh, rodents, and insects. So the diversity is much bigger. But they don't need to, need to drink water because they have enough water in the food. On the other hand, birds like the sand grouses, they are totally feeding only on seeds, on dry seeds. So the sand grouse, like the Liechtenstein sand grouse, they need to fly once a day to drink water. And from studies, they, it was found out that they are flying up to 30 kilometers every day to drink water and then back to the sites where they are nesting. So for the sand grouse, it's not a big story. The problem is when they have chicks, and the chicks, when they hatch, they cannot fly. So what they are doing when they are coming to a water source, they uh, suck water in the chest with the feathers. They have covered, covered feathers which are protecting it from evaporation, and then they fly back 30 kilometers to get uh, water to their chicks. And a chick which hatches from the head with the sand grouse, the first thing that the chick knows to do is to get into the chest of the father and suck water. So you see, they are well adapted. So if you're saying a bird brain, I take it personally. This is a very developed system that they know what to do. As Anna uh, uh, already said, when you have one billion birds, for, for research, it's a big story. But for the Air Force, it's a disaster. They lost in three decades 11 aircraft, 75 collisions with a damage above one million, and three pilots were killed. Just one picture, this pilot flew nine miles from Masada on the Judean desert, 420 knots. One eagle penetrated the F-16 engine. He ejected, and he was almost killed, but he succeeded uh, to, to rescue. So what we did in a study that I was leading in Tel Aviv University, across the country, we put every kilometer two bird watchers to count the numbers of the raptors. We started to use a radar, uh, which was run by Tel Aviv University, to follow the migration with radars. I was flying with a motorized glider for 270 days to map the height of the bears, and the idea, and as you can see here, and for the first time ever in the world, we started to use uh, drones to follow the migration. So by using all this system, we developed a, a new bird plant zone a system for the Israeli Air Force, and the idea was very simple. The biggest bears are causing the biggest problem, so they stop to fly at the time when the, the, the soaring birds are flying over Israel at the height and the routes that we map them. As you can see here, we are sitting right now here in the Dead Sea near Masada, and immediately since 84, it's now 34 years, that the number of the collision, it was already said, dropped down dramatically. 
Then we started to follow the migration. We have here a, a guest from Max Planck Institute for Means, I think. I made a joint study with the Max Planck Institute in Radolfzell, and we put on 120 stocks uh, radio transmitters. Angela Merkel was at that time the Minister of en Environment, so she gave Tel Aviv University a nice amount to follow 120 stocks. And um, six years ago, she got a PhD of honor, and I told our president, give me 15 minutes, maybe I can get more money from her. But he told me, no time, no time, Yossi, she comes for 45 minutes. And then only two minutes before the ceremony, she wanted to say hello, and I ran there, and my parents are from Germany, so I speak German, and I told her, Dr. Merkel, you gave us 1.3 million 10 years ago. Now that you are the chancellor, we are looking for 13 million. So she said, no, no, now I'm only with people, not with Baird anymore. But basically what we did, when we got, when we got the, 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 the joint study with Max Planck in the youth, we followed 120 uh, birds with our Minister of Education, we developed a website to follow online the migrating birds. And uh, Professor Rubinstein, who was the Minister of Environment at that time, matched the whole thing. And we gave the birds Jewish name, Christian name, and Muslim name to make it a global story. And I show you now, Simit Princessa, uh, uh, one bird which was called Princessa, she moved near uh, from Loburg, it's a small village near uh, Princess and Jonas. And just one out of 120, she left Germany through the Bosphorus and she moved till Cape Town. And the male, you can see here, moved to Spain. She doesn't need a husband all year long around. So he moved to Spain. She moved to Sudan. She stayed along the Nile in Sudan. And then for 13 successive years, every year at the same timing, at the same route, she moved from Sudan along the Nile till Cape Town. We made with the German TV. Huh? I told you he is a wasted guy. He should be in building. But she stayed on the same tree for 13 years till she passed away, and then all the way back. You see, almost at the same route. Okay. So I just want to show you in one minute 20 uh, years of study. You will see now the summary of 120 stocks. Summary half of them from Western Germany are moving through the Gibraltar. Again, as I said, they don't fly over the Mediterranean, uh, but most of them fly over the Great Rift Valley. Every dot is a stalk with a radio that we study together with Max Planck. So you see, they fly to the west, to Gibraltar, and to West Africa, but most of them along the Great Rift Valley, over Israel and Jordan, along the Great Rift Valley, and then all the way back. Okay. That's all. Okay. So we made a big educational project. We made a big website of Tel Aviv University. And suddenly, Palestinian and Jordanian were joining forces with us. One project. Second project of regional cooperation, which became a big story. Uh, as you know, we, uh, the farmers in the Middle East are using a lot of pesticides and killing many of the European migrating birds, and of course, affecting the people and the soil. So we started to build nesting boxes for barn owls, and they are like the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, between 7 and 14 chicks every year. And uh, we started to follow the immigration to stop and use pesticides. And since 2008, it became a national project. And now we have 4,000 nesting boxes all over Israel. Every pair is eating between 2,000 and 6,000 uh, rodents a year. And here you can see the summary till 2014. The number of uh, nesting boxes rose up, and the, the orange is the use of pesticides, which dropped down dramatically. This worked so well since 2008. We started to join forces with the Jordanian and Palestinian. The, the guy here is a general who was running the peace process with Israel. And you have to understand, for the Muslim, owls bringing bad luck. So we convinced them owls are bringing good luck. And you can see here the farmers 
And the main issue was not only that we developed a, a study of the barn owls and how they can change the using of the pesticide, it became a project for people to people, of the farmers and the researchers and the conservationists in Palestine. And the, the general, six years ago, uh, came with me to the Knesset, gave a lecture to 400 people in the Knesset, in the parliament. We put an exhibit in the parliament, and Rub Rivlin was a speaker, now he's our president, told me, Yossi, this was the best day in the, in the year. So I, you know, I'm 70 years now, it was 65. I told him, Mr. Rublin, probably everyone who makes an event, you want him to leave happy the parliament, that's the best day. He said, no, I tried to bring a, a VIP from Jordan, I, didn't make, I couldn't make it, but with the bird, you did it. So you see, we are together with them dancing and walking together. The top was five years ago, when the first time ever we had an Israeli a male and a, a Jordanian female, and they got seven chicks. And I showed it to the government, so the minister of religion asked me, so what are the chicks, Jewish or Muslim? <laughs> you know, smart people. And two years ago, for the first time ever, we have one male with two females, and they got 19 chicks. Can you imagine bringing food for 19 chicks and one female? This is disaster. But they made it. And before I finish, I just want to show you two short stories of the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, they saw an imperial eagle, a global endangered species in the Western Negev flying. But you can see here the, the, the leather uh, parts. These are a, a falconer. So very, very fast we learn that the guy from Port Said in Egypt was the guy who was the trainer through the Facebook. And he asked us to get the, the, the eagle back to him. We told him, no, we want to release it. So what we found out in the Facebook, he was making his money by getting models with this eagle. So that's the end of the story, because we, a, a guy, a vet from uh, the Negev caught the eagle, he blessed with a chicken, and next week it will be released back to the wild. And a lot of hunting in the Middle East. Last week, we had a, a, another black stroke female from Czech, Slovakia, from Czech Republic. And she came to the Beishan Valley, which is about 100 kilometers north of Rift, in the Great Rift Valley. And we were following them in the internet, what she's doing. She moved um, last Tuesday from the Beishan Valley to Jordan. At the same day, she was shot by a Jordanian hunter. And here you can see the route from Czech till Beishan Valley and the route she did. But the stupid hunter from Jordan, he didn't understand what is a, 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 a satellite transmitter. He left it at his home. So I immediately found the place with the Google Earth, and we sent the intelligence of Jordan. They didn't find it yet because it's somewhere in his house, but they promised me you'll get back the radio transmitter, for, not for us, for the Czech guys. So to sum up, in two weeks, we have a seminar in the other side of the Dead Sea in Jordan with people from Palestine, from Jordan, of course, we are leading it. And for the first time ever, we have uh, 12 guests from uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt. All the invitation is with no logo, the, legs, uh, the, the flex I just put for you, because we don't want to be in the front. We put Israel in the back, you know, the Israelis like to stand in the front. But you, we got the money, we can stay in the back, and hopefully this will go now to the, uh, all over also in Northern Africa. Thank you very much. If you join forces, you can fish even in a highway. But you have to know where you are going, and I like it from South Africa, I always show it, our public bar is presently not open because it is closed, manager. This is a very simple message to people. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Yossi. This is obviously fascinating. Uh, we'll take a couple of uh, questions now before we move to a somewhat different uh, uh, topic. So, yes, please. First of all, this is not a rule. Some birds are flying together, some are separating. Uh, we, couldn't, we, we got both of them when they've been already adult. But probably what happened here, probably, we cannot say it for sure, the birds of West Germany are moving to Gibraltar. East Germany are moving through the Eastern Flyway. Uh, but in Western Germany, because the modern agriculture, the numbers drop down dramatically. So this man moved to Eastern Germany to find, to find a nice lady. Now they were coming back year after year, 10 years. In 10 years, what happened, the, the, male, the female was stuck in Sudan in a heavy storm for two weeks, so she couldn't come in time back to her husband. He was waiting here. When she came back, 
disaster. There was a young lady with four eggs in the nest. He didn't took a chance. And for, we had a web camera for 10 days. She tried to chase the young lady because everything was perfect in the family. So as Noga said, the message to take home, kind time in time to your wife, to your, to your wife or husband, otherwise you are in trouble. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yossi.